pray together. Father, as we have come to you in song and sung of your grace and your beauty, your majesty, your character, that you have taken sin and washed it away, that you have given new hearts, new affections, new desires, a new nature. Father, I pray that we would not take that for granted. And this morning as we deal with a difficult text, we confess that the difficulty comes from the way we see ourselves, not who you are, from our ideas, and not from your plans, from our flaws, and not from your perfect character. And so, Father, would you help us to submit to your word this morning? Would you send your spirit to teach us, to convict us, to change us, and transform us to be more like your son, so that as we leave here this morning, we would leave in a greater awestruck worship than when we came in at the magnitude of the cost of our salvation and the great lengths to which you go to purchase your people. Father, would you do this for your glory and for our good in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to go ahead and be seated. Um, <clears throat> if, you are, if you're new here, see a lot of new faces, I want to welcome you and tell you that we are thankful that you chose to join us this morning and you are welcome and uh, hope, that, hope that you feel that and, um, and know that. And this morning what we would typically do is before we begin our, our time in the Word together, we begin by memorizing or working on a passage that we're memorizing as a church. And this month we're working on Romans 8, 5 through 6 as a greater goal of memorizing the uh, eighth chapter of Romans together. And so uh, I've got part of it on the screen. It's in your bulletin if you have that or look it up in your Bible if you'd like to. Or if you don't know it, that's fine. You can just be quiet during the blank parts and quote with everybody else during the parts that, that are up on the screen. Um, but I invite you to join me in, in reciting Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 6. It says this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. As we have been working through this eighth chapter of Romans and memorizing, I've just been, as I said last week, I've just been amazed at how God has orchestrated that to sync up with what we're preaching on uh, as we're working through the book of Romans. And this morning we're going to be in Romans chapter 3. Uh, we're going to be looking at, admittedly, a difficult text. And this text is not difficult because it's hard to understand. There are some texts that are difficult because they're difficult to comprehend, difficult to understand. This is not that. This is not a hard text for that reason. It's a hard text for two reasons. Number one, what it says. And number two, how it confronts our own ideas of who we are or were um, as unbelievers before Christ. And so Paul has been working through systematically in chapter 1, establishing that all of the Gentiles stand condemned before God. In chapter 2, he has argued that all of the Jews stand be condemned before God. And these are all people outside of Christ uh, that have not trusted in Christ. And he's, he's sort of systematically broken apart all of their uh, idols, as being Jewish. Well, we're God's people. We, are, uh, we have the law. We have circumcision. And, and Paul argues, no, 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 no. All these things are not merely external. They were all supposed to be internal. It was all about faith all throughout the Old Testament. Um, it screams faith, 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 and you missed it. You missed it. You made it all external. The circumcision thing, it was all about a circumcision of the heart. And in fact, there are Gentiles that have been circumcised of heart, that have trusted in Jesus Christ, that are more Jewish, more Israelite than you are because of that. And so then last week he dealt with some objections that come up and uh, invite you to, if you, if you weren't here, you want to catch up on that, that's on iTunes, on uh, iTunes podcast, or you can go to the Arbor Drive website, arborddrive.org, and check that out, uh, or you can search it on iTunes. But basically he deals with their objections. And the point from last week is don't let objections, don't let uh, problems with the way that we think stand in the way of faith. 
Don't let our presumptions and our issues stand in the way of faith. And we saw that they, questioned, they did things like questioning God's character. They, um, they sought to justify themselves in sin. And, and we've all done that at some point or another. And so on the tail end of him answering their objections, Paul provides probably what we might consider a summary of chapter 1, 18 through chapter, uh, the end of chapter 2. Um, He's just going to summarize it and just put it all in one scathing, long indictment. And so uh, what we're going to see is there there are two points for this morning. And uh, what we're going to see is that all humanity universally stands guilty before God and therefore is in need of the saving grace of God provided in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the main point. All of humanity stands under condemnation and guilt before God and are under the the condemnation and control of sin and therefore need the saving grace of God as provided in Jesus Christ to redeem them and purchase them from that. So as I said, two points. Let me read through this first. Romans 3 verses 9 through 18. What then, are the Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jew and Greek, are under sin. As it is written, no one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips, their mouths are full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So point number one this morning could be summed up with what is the scope of sin? What is the scope of sin? Romans chapter 3, verse 9. What then are the Jews better off? known at all. For we have already charged. So Paul, in Romans uh, 1.18 through the end of chapter 2, has already established this, and he's just sort of summarizing it. And the point is that all, both Jew and Greek. So if you wonder what all means, like maybe that's a nuanced Greek word. You know, like maybe in, the, maybe in the original language, it meant something different than all. You know, in, in English, we can say, uh, I want all the fries. And we mean, I want every single one of the fries, right? Maybe in Greek, it only means I want 75% of them, right? I can assure you that is not the case. This is not a nuanced word in Greek. It means all. All means all. And just to clarify that, Paul... Uh, Paul clarifies that even further by saying both Jew and Greeks. Those are the two categories in humanity that, God, or that, that Paul works in. There are Jews and there are Greeks. There are Israelites and there's everyone else. And Paul says that all, and by all I mean everybody, are under sin. You see, Paul has spent from 118 through the end of chapter 2 establishing this and undergirding this and arguing this. And now there's people that are still objecting. And he, he says, so what? Are the Jews any better off? Remember the objection started. Is there no advantage to being a Jew then? In Romans 3 verse 1. And he said, yes, there are advantages. But now he says, while there are advantages, while you have things like the word... While you have things like circumcision, while you have this special revelation, you're no better off in your standing before God than all of the rest of humanity. You have advantages, but you're not better off. Because I've already told you in in those two chapters that everybody, without distinction, both Jew and Greek, are under sin. That's an important word there, under sin sin. We're under the power of sin, the dominion of sin. We're captive to sin. We're slaves to sin. We're slaves to Satan. As, as, as Paul says in Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 3, you were dead in your trespasses and sins among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath 
like the rest of mankind. All stand guilty before God because all are under sin. The Bible uses a lot of different metaphors for that. It, it's dead in Ephesians. It's, it's uh, John 8, 44. He says, you are of your father, the devil. You belong to him. You're under his dominion. You're under his reign. In, John, or in Romans 6, 6, he talks about being a slave to sin and being freed from that captivity to sin. All people, and he, he mentions all in some way or another eight times in this section. He uses all twice, and then six other times he says, like, no one. No, not even one. That type of all-inclusive language. And so the point is here that our nature was radically changed in the fall of Adam. All of humanity has inherited a nature by which we are enslaved to sin. We belong to sin. We are under the dominion and power of sin. And all of humanity fell with Adam. And he'll get into that more in Romans chapter 5. But just think, for me, think with me for a second about the text that we're memorizing. Romans chapter 8. Two things that are contrasted, spirit and flesh. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. In, in Adam falling, we all became flesh, in the flesh. We live in the flesh. We're captive to sin. So sin controls humanity apart from Christ. And this is the condition of all men without Christ. Sin has affected all humanity. So that's point number one. So the next question is, to what degree does sin affect humanity? Because I think, I think all Christians um, would agree that sin has affected humanity. Right? The question is, to what degree? How much has sin affected humanity? Do we retain some aspect of goodness within us? Though we are 90% under sin, are we 10% decent people? Good people? And, and, and keep in mind, what we're talking about here is we're talking about in relation to God. Right? We often compare ourselves to other people. I'm better than that person. The point of comparison in Scripture is never one to another, it's one to God. In other words, my point of comparison is not those people around me. I can't walk past somebody that is addicted to uh, drugs and living on the street and say, well, I'm better than that person. That's not how this thing works. In Scripture, it's always compared to God, who is holy, 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 who is perfect, who is righteous. The essence of God is righteousness and holiness and white, hot holiness. Not even just like a, a, a little bit of holiness, like consuming holiness. And that's the backdrop which Paul is using as a point of comparison. It's not like, I'm not righteous compared to Mark Fletcher. It's, I'm not righteous compared to God. That's the point that he's getting at. So what is the scope of this? And, and there are uh, a few different points that I want to make as he goes on. And I, what I want to show you is that sin, in this point, sin has affected not only all of humanity, but all of our humanity. Sin has not only affected all humanity, but all of our humanity. In other words, it's not just one aspect of us that's sinful. It's the totality of our being that is sinful. So what degree has sin affected mankind? He says in verse 10, as it is written, no one is righteous. So here's another one of those unqualified all type statements. No one is righteous. Really? No one, Paul? Yeah, no, not one. Not one single person is righteous. And beloved, that's our problem. When you 
consider a righteous, holy God. We are inherently unrighteous. And that's our problem. Unrighteousness cannot stand before a righteous God. That's the issue that Paul draw, draws out. And, and hear me on this, okay? Because the problem with humanity, I tried to put this in like a little tweetable quote so that we could easily remember it. Um, this is really important, okay? The problem with humanity is not that we make unrighteous choices. It's not what Paul's getting at here. The problem with humanity is not that we make unrighteous choices. The problem with humanity is that we are, at our core, unrighteous. And that's the problem, isn't it? That's why Paul starts with, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. We are unrighteous and in need of righteousness. And God provides that for us in the gospel. The unrighteousness of our flesh, of our fallen humanity, is replaced with the righteousness of Christ credited to us. And therefore, we have righteousness. That's the good news. But how good is good news if you don't believe the bad news? Really, Paul, no one's righteous? Not even one? Do you see how this, how this relates to the gospel? If you are sitting there thinking, oh, I'm kind of righteous. I'm not unrighteous. I'm kind of righteous. I do some pretty doggone good things. This guy doesn't know me. You don't know what I do. I'm righteous, or at least somewhat righteous then you're never going to be in desperate need for righteousness that you cannot produce on your own. And you will always be striving to produce that righteousness within you. And you will always fall short because the standard is the righteousness of Christ. The main problem with humanity is we need an alien righteousness because we are not righteous. And so unrighteousness sums up humanity. So number one, uh, part A or sub point A is that it has affected the totality of our humanity in that we are inherently unrighteous. Number two or B, um, I lost my place here real quick. Hang on. Okay. Um, number two, the intellect, the mind, has been damaged and tainted by the fall of Adam by sin. We see that in verse 11. No one understands. No one understands. The mind of humanity has been corrupted by sin. We see that in John 8, 43 and 44. Christ is talking to the Pharisees, and what does he say? Why do you not understand what I say? So here's the Pharisees, and they don't understand what's going on, what Christ is talking about. And here's his answer. It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. See, the problem wasn't that Christ was speaking in words that people couldn't understand. It's not that he was speaking at a uh, master's degree level and they were all at a sixth grade level. The problem is that sin has so affected all of our being that our minds, apart from the Spirit of God working and renewing our minds in the Word of God, cannot comprehend the truth. We don't understand. 
John 12, 39 through 40. Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. What about 1 Corinthians 2, 14? The natural person, the person in Adam, the person in under sin, the person in the flesh, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So, not only are we unrighteous, but also our uh, mind has been uh, damaged by sin. We can't understand spiritual things apart from God doing something. The third thing is our speech has been affected by sin. Notice in verse 13, it says, Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Think of the venom of asps. It's poison. It's destructive. Their throat is an open grave. It's, it's got contamination and sickness and brings harm to people. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. So, sort of like the same thing that Paul was saying in Romans 3, 8, which some people have slanderously charged Paul with advocating that, well, we just use grace as a license to sin. That's the kind of person that he has in mind here. Or in, or in Romans 3, 4, where he says, Let God be true, though all men be liars. All men are liars. Our speech has affected us. And, and he takes this quote directly from Psalm 5, verses 4 to 6. So let me read that to you real quick. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. So this is a big deal to God. The fact that sin has so permeated our humanity that we speak lies and deceit, that we, um, we are... Uh, destructive in our language that from us from our mouths come bitterness and cursings what does christ say about these things he says that from the heart flows the speech so sin has affected us so much that we speak evil things flowing from an evil heart matthew 15 19 is where i get that from for out of the heart comes evil thoughts Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. John eight forty four. You are of the father, your devil, and your do, your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Brings us to the next one. Verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This word fear here is the word phobos. We get phobia from it. There is no terror of God. This is an attitude problem, and our attitudes have been influenced by sin. So rather than having a healthy fear of God in all of his majesty and splendor and righteousness and holiness, we walk through life not fearing him at all, being indifferent toward him, not caring what he thinks. Sinful people should be in terror of a holy God, not indifferent toward him. Not only that, if you look in verse 15, we see that the actions of men have been influenced by sin or affected by sin. Their feet are swift to shed blood. 
In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Now, wait a minute. I haven't murdered anybody. We live in our culture that murders babies in mass. And how many of the unbelieving world are ready to stand for the unborn? There are a few externally moral people, but the chant that we hear from everybody else is it's not murder, it's fine. And our actions have been so influenced by sin that it leads to nothing but ruin and misery. Ruin is the destructive activities that we do and the result is misery. You see, sin always promises something really, really good but never, ever delivers. It always leaves a path of ruin and misery in its wake and they haven't known the way of peace. You cannot know true peace until you are known by the Prince of Peace. I'm talking about an inner peace. I'm talking about like a peace of conscience. Our consciences can be seared, yes, but deep down we know the truth about who we are even though we suppress it in our unrighteousness. So we are inherently unrighteous. Our minds have been affected by sin. Our attitudes have been affected by sin. Our actions have been affected by sin. Our speech has been affected by sin. But there's, there's one more from this text. And I saved this one for last because I wanted you to hear those other ones before you got mad at me and stopped listening to what I had to say. Okay? And here's why. Because most of us would say, yes, Paul agreed. But when we get to this next one, the response is typically, how dare you? Don't you dare do that. Don't go there. Don't take that one. You can't address this one. Because it, it's kind of like an idol in our hearts that we've constructed. I'm trying to make the build up really good here. Um, all right, here it is. It comes in verse 11 and 12. So we already saw that the intellect here, no one understands. But then there's this one, no one seeks for God. Beloved, our will has been affected and destroyed by the power of sin. Now here's where people get upset because you can, you, can, you can talk about a lot of things, but how dare you talk about my free will? How dare you? I was the decisive factor in my salvation. That's what a lot of people would argue. And what Paul is saying here is that no one seeks God. And instead, all without distinction, including you and me, have turned aside. So not only is there no running toward God, there's actually a running away from God. Our will has been impacted by the fall of Adam and by sin such that left to their own devices, no man anywhere would ever seek God out and every man would be running away from God. Do you see that there? Like, do you, are you tracking with me on this text? Because I don't want this to be like my own construct. Like, you've got to see this for yourself in Scripture. So, basically what Paul is saying here is that rather than running toward God, everyone runs away from God. They avoid Him. They don't want God. There's no desire for God. Now, I've shown you in the text, and, and I want to argue this from another angle, okay? And this angle is from going to Romans chapter 8. So that, that passage that we're memorizing, that, that uh, chapter that we're memorizing, I'm going to read just a few verses from here, starting in verse 35. 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Okay. Do you believe that text? Now, I'm going to ask for audience participation. I don't typically do this, but I'm going to ask for audience participation. Do you believe that promise of God that was stated right there in Romans chapter 8? Raise your hand if you do. Okay. If you believe that once you are saved by God's grace, you cannot be unsaved, if you believe that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus once we are His, as you just affirm that you do, then you don't really believe in a self-determining free will. If you believe this is true, you do not really believe in a self-determining free will. In other words, you don't believe that you and your choice and your decision and your will were the final, decisive, ultimate factor in your salvation. And here's why. If we are the final determining factor in our salvation, merely aided by God's grace... And if our so-called free will was the operative agent in our salvation, then God could never make universal promises like this one to all believers everywhere. Because the same self-determining free will that got you saved can be exercised by you to not believe, and therefore you are not saved, and therefore God cannot make promises like this. Because God has no control over whether or not you're saved. He's just sitting there wringing his hands thinking, oh, I hope they keep believing by their self-determining free will so that I can do what I promised I'd do to them. But that's not how God operates. Romans 8, 35 to 39 cannot be true if you believe in your own self-determining free will, because it would not be based on God's promises, but based on your continual self-willing to believe. It wouldn't depend on God's faithfulness, but you continually exercising your free will. It follows then that God could not make promises of security because it wouldn't depend on him, but on your so-called free will which he exercises no sovereign control over. Do you see that? So here's the picture that's being painted. Because of the fall, our wills have been damaged and destroyed by sin such that no one runs toward God. Everyone runs away from God and therefore God must do something to save us. In other words, let me, let me try to put this another way. We make decisions out of our nature. I'm not arguing you don't make real choices. Okay? What I'm arguing is that we make choices out of our nature. So here's how I'll illustrate this. Um, you put meat in front of a deer. Is anybody preventing him from eating that? Is he able to eat that? Yes. But he will never eat it. You put a juicy uh, what's the T-bone, medium, rare, just, oh, yeah, right in front of him and stand back. And there's a, a load of crummy grass next to him. He will choose the grass every single time because he is constrained in his choices by his nature. And what Paul is arguing here, that our nature has been corrupted by sin. 
We need a new nature, a new birth, a new creation with new will and new desires. So another way to put it is we do what we love and we will what we love. We will what we love and therefore we do what we love. We're constrained by our nature and the disposition of our hearts, which, by the way, apart from Christ, is wickedness and unrighteousness. So think of a bird with a broken wing. A bird with a broken wing is free to fly, right? But totally unable to do so. He needs the wing healed in order to be able to fly, and then will fly because that is of his nature to do that. And the point that Paul is making is that the new birth, through the Holy Spirit giving us a new heart, heals our spiritual broken wing, as it were, and the result is we fly, which is faith. We believe, we seek God. So what is this? Let me just say one more thing before we move to application. Like, I know that this is a hot-button topic because we've been indoctrinated with we are our own masters of our own destinies. It's part of the American dream. It's part of the way that we were raised. Um, I know that this is challenging. But I also know that almost every single argument that I've ever heard against this is an emotional argument or an argument from a moral superior position to God. Not from his word. Not an exegetical argument from scripture. Scripture says that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. We need to be made alive by God. So, how do we apply this? What does this mean for us? I'll give you a few things. Number one, all men everywhere stand in need of the gospel. Everyone, because we are universally sinners, is needful of the gospel. Now, here's what I mean by that. All men need the gospel. They don't need gimmicks. They don't need a bait and switch. They don't need you to appeal to their flesh. They need to be confronted with the radical nature of their sin with their radical unrighteousness and the holiness and righteousness of God and be reconciled to God by the gospel, through faith in the gospel. They don't need their ears tickled. They don't need to be entertained. They don't need a friend, as, as we might put it, if by that we mean somebody to just hang out with and be cool with. Do you, do you see what I mean? Like... Everyone needs the gospel, so we need to take the gospel. Don't waste your time on gimmicks. You know, well, maybe if I, maybe if I like, uh, make it more appealing. Like, how are you going to clean this thing up? Like, how are you going to clean this up? You've made some mistakes. Yeah, now you're not being faithful to Scripture. And because the mind is fallen and affected by sin, you're probably going to get laughed at, or cursed at, or made fun of, or belittled, or ignored, or pushed away. But you gave them what they needed. So much of modern evangelism is focused on getting a decision, manipulating into a decision. What people need are not to make decisions for Christ. They need to be transformed by the power of gospel and continually be trusting in Jesus for the rest of their lives. It's not about a one-time decision. It's about being a new creation with a new nature that responds in faith and joyful pursuit of God. So when we see that God must do something, namely change the heart, change the nature, and he alone can do that, it frees us to be faithful to the gospel without the pressure of producing the result. 
So all men stand in need of the gospel. That's application number one. So give them the gospel. Like, what, do your, what do your kids need to survive? They need nutrition. What if you gave them a steady diet of uh, gushers? From the time that they could eat, you just pumped sugar into them. Nonstop, nothing else. And maybe you threw a little meat in occasionally. They get accustomed to the sugar. They want the sugar. Beloved, give them Christ. Give them truth. Give them the gospel. That's number one. Number two is this. The gospel alone deals with sin. The gospel deals with sin. We don't pick ourselves up and work this thing out on our own. The gospel does. Imputed righteousness from Christ deals with our sin. We don't muster our own. So we need to understand the gospel and why we are sent into the world. If everyone stands in need of the gospel and the gospel is the only thing that can deal with sin, and we're the heralds of the gospel, it would behoove us to understand it and be able to articulate it. I, I try to help people out with just four terms. Creation, fall, redemption, consummation. Creation, we were created to be in fellowship with God. Fall, sin has destroyed that fellowship and ruined us before a holy God. So we stand before him conde condemned. Consummate, or, uh, creation, fall, redemption. Christ came into the world as the God-man, perfectly obeying the Father where we had failed to obey Him, perfectly righteous before Him, and went to a cross to die as an innocent party so that all of the guilty people that trust in Him and believe in Him can have His righteousness credited as theirs and have their sin taken by Him. And He died and was buried and on the third day, he rose again, showing that that was acceptable before God and that everything that he said was true and that it really was finished. And so consummation for all those who trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, who lay down their own effort, their own righteousness, and, and, and solely, wholly rest in Christ and look to him and trust in him. They will one day enter into glory and the condemnation will not fall on them because it fell on Christ. At the judgment bar, they will hear not guilty, enter into my joy, and they will spend eternity with God in fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. That's what does it. So the gospel alone deals with sin. Which brings us to number three. We are heralds of this good news. We are ambassadors for Christ. And he is making his appeal through us. It's what we are left on earth for. So how many people are there in your life that need the gospel? And do you just sit there and think, well, somebody else will do that? Or are you faithful to the fact that God put you there and saved you so that you might proclaim his excellencies to them? Finally, reflect on the greatness of the depth of your own sin and utter helplessness and hopelessness without God rescuing you. It's, it's healthy to think about that. Like Paul did. He considered who he was before Christ. And so many times where they just have positive thoughts. Positive, 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 positive. You know what? You know what's positive? Worship. And worship is fueled by rightly seeing myself and my utter hopelessness and helplessness apart from Christ and that in Christ I have everything and I'm reconciled to God and there's no more guilt, no more condemnation, no more judgment and let that spur you to worship. Beloved, you always have the fuel to worship God. If you believe what Paul says in Romans 3, 1 or 9 through 18, because that was you. And through Christ, he redeemed you and made you a new creation. Let me just close with this. 
Let me just say this. God does not withhold salvation from those who desire it. God does not withhold salvation from those who desire it. The point here is that no one even desires it apart from a changed heart. So if you're here and you're like, man, I, I really want that. I want that salvation. I want that joy. I want that peace. I don't want to be this person over here anymore. I want to be like that. God does not withhold that from you. And that's evidence of the Holy Spirit working because apart from the Holy Spirit, nobody seeks God. So let this spur us to greater worship and greater joy in Christ as we reflect on the great cost of our salvation and how utterly helpless we are apart from Christ. Let's pray. Father, I just pray now that we would submit to your word and rejoice in the provision that you made for us in Christ, that we would rejoice in the fact that we have new hearts, that we are counted as righteous because of Christ's righteousness, that we are able to renew our minds through the word, that we have new affections that drive us to your son, that your spirit gives us understanding and wisdom, that our lips are able to reflect our hearts and be used to build up and not tear down, and that our attitudes are one of fear and reverence and worship toward you as our great Savior and Father. Would you do something within us to cause us to worship you even more as we accept and rejoice in those truths? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.